When I started dreaming about what my memoir, The Ninth Child, would look like, all I knew for sure was that I wanted cover art that was beautiful and compelling. I had a few specific elements in mind, but most of all, I wanted to feel joy and freedom and light in my spirit every time I looked at it. I wanted to commission an original painting, so I needed to find an artist. Thanks to my side gig as a costume designer, I know a few people in the Calgary arts community. That's how I met Kyla Ferrier. In 2019, I was the costumer for Babette's Feast, staged by Fire Exit Theater, and Kyla played one of the leads. She kindly accepted my friend request on Facebook, and I followed her with interest when she added painting to her artistic expressions during the pandemic. I reached out to her, and we started a conversation about collaborating on an abstract representational piece that would be used to create the cover for my book. Kyla was intrigued by the idea of creating art for book covers and was eager to work with my book designer and fellow author, Travis Williams. My concept for the art was influenced by a guided meditation with Liz Johnson at Nirvana Health using ARDR, audio reflex desensitization and reprocessing. Liz has a lovely, calming presence, which creates a safe and welcoming atmosphere in her office. We spent some time chatting about my adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, and what I could expect. Liz explained that this would be different from the regular type of talk therapy I had been used to. Because ARDR takes a different approach, there was no need to go back to the beginning and drag up every detail of traumas experienced throughout my life. The main thing is, how have they affected me? I explained, as I often do, in a word picture. Before neurofeedback, my place of trauma looked like a big, abandoned, concrete lot. It was covered in a tangle of weeds and vines and garbage that had blown in. Over time, with the help of talk therapy, I had cut through parts of it in an attempt to make a clear, safe pathway to get to the trauma in the middle. But my health benefits would run out, the therapy would stop, and it all grew over again. Neurofeedback cleared out all of the weeds and vines and garbage which represented my persistent, severe depression. Now I had a clear, empty concrete lot, with one exception. There was my trauma, in the form of a pile of discarded scrap metal. It looked like a mound of junk, but it was, in fact, a structure of sorts, as if a group of kids had collected whatever scraps they could find, leaned all the pieces up against each other, and tried to build a clubhouse. There it sat, right in the middle of the lot. I could clearly see it, but I couldn't access it. I couldn't step even one foot onto the lot. It was as if some kind of invisible force field prevented me from doing anything except look at it from the outside. When I described this to Liz, she handed me a pair of noise-canceling headphones connected to a tablet. Put these on, close your eyes, and go back to that lot. You will hear music, but I want you to focus on the lot. This would be like meditation, only instead of trying to achieve complete focus on only one thought to the exclusion of all others, I was instructed to welcome and follow every thought or experience that came along. Ask why. Follow the rabbit trails to see where they lead. Everything in this space was there for a reason. If I could come up with a name for the structure that might be helpful. If not, no problem. When the music ended, I could remove the headphones. I closed my eyes, the music started, and instantly I was transported to the lot. But this time, it was different. I was able to step onto the lot and walk up to the structure. I was my child self, little Lisa, six years old wearing the dress and socks and shoes I had worn the day I was molested. 
I expected to feel bad, heavy vibes as I drew closer. But the opposite was true. I felt curious. I wanted a closer look. I named the structure Curious Heap. As I came closer, a horde of cockroaches swarmed out, frantically climbing all over it. I felt fear, but it didn't belong to me. The fear came from the cockroaches. One of them scurried over to me, ran across the toe of my shoe, waved its little antenna at me, and ran back inside. All the cockroaches fled back inside as well. Then it was as if they had conducted a meeting where the one told the rest that I wasn't there to hurt them, but they couldn't be there anymore. They all left through the bottom of the curious heap and ran away. I began investigating, walking all around it. I saw the sunlight streaming in through jagged holes. I saw one big dandelion growing out of the base and more baby dandelion leaves sprouting from between the cracks. I explored my way around to the front again and noticed there was a door. I opened it, stepped inside and realized I had been there before. When I was molested at age six, I worked diligently to make myself forget. I had succeeded until the memory flooded back when I was 23. That was when I got a vision of my six-year-old self shackled by my ankle to my little rocking chair in a dark, abandoned shack. There were holes where the sunlight streamed in. I could hear children laughing and playing in the meadow full of wildflowers just outside the door. But I couldn't leave. I was sock-footed, still wearing the dirty anklets that were ruined when I ran away from my molester. When I did the work on forgiving my molester, the vision came again. This time, the rocking chair was empty and the shackle was broken. I could hear my own laughter in the wildflower meadow outside the door. I saw the rocking chair with the broken shackle still attached. But this time, I saw the dirty socks lying on the ground. They had been left behind, along with my shame. I felt relief that little Lisa was finally, truly free. She wasn't carrying around those dirty shameful socks any longer. This entire place was devoid of life, abandoned and useless. I wanted to dismantle it and started examining it closer to see how that could be accomplished without it crashing in and hurting me. I had no idea how to begin, but I knew Liz was there to help me. I felt strong enough. I felt hope and joy. I knew this place would become something beautiful instead. The vision changed, and instead of the curious heap, I saw a huge shade tree in full leaf with my rocking chair sitting in the shade at its base. It was surrounded by a fragrant field of wildflowers. I knew this place would remain as a place of hope and healing and joy for anyone who needed to come here and recover. I shared this experience with Kyla and sent her an early draft of my manuscript. The painting she created was a perfect representation of my trauma and my healing. If you look closely, you can see my rocking chair in the shadows and my dirty socks laying on the ground as little Lisa runs toward the sunshine with her collie dog. Travis Williams, my cover designer, collaborated with Kyla and me from the very beginning of the project. He created a beautiful book cover using select parts of the original art. It is deeply meaningful to me, and I hope you love it too.